interrupted. We proceed to questions without notice. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Mr. Uh, Senator Conroy. I refer the minister to the Prime Minister's press conference three years ago today, the day after she displaced the elected Prime Minister by a midnight coup, when she justified her behaviour by telling the Australian people that the government had, in her words, lost its way and, in particular, she nominated three problems her government would solve, namely the problem of carbon pricing, the problem of the mining tax and the problem of irregular maritime arrivals. Which of those problems does the government consider have now been solved? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator uh, Brandis for his question. At the first press conference, the Prime Minister was asked Mr. President, what her priorities were. And she replied, and I quote, My priority, as we look through the issues of the government, is to make sure that in every area we are working hard for Australian families. We are working hard for those Australians who work hard themselves, who set the alarm clock early who get up in the morning, get the kids to school and go to work and work hard. I want to make sure that we are working with them. And, Mr President, that is exactly what this government has achieved. Mr President, Labor in government has kept our economy strong in the face of the global financial crisis. The economy, Mr President, the economy, Mr. President, is 14 per cent larger now than it was when we came to government, outperforming other advanced economies. The cash rate, the cash rate is very low, Mr. President, at 2.75 per cent, lower than at any time under the last Liberal government. Let me just repeat that, Mr. President. The cash rate, interest rate, is lower than at any time under those previous. Any, any time. Mr President, the unemployment rate at 5.5 per cent is well below the OECD average of 8 per cent, and we continue to enjoy a triple A credit rating from each of the three leading rating agencies. Something those opposite in government Order. never, Conroy. never Order. achieved. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary question. Given that in the year prior to Ms. Gillard's backstabbing of the elected Prime Minister, the number of irregular maritime arrivals was 6,606 people on 140 boats, and that in the three years since Ms. Gillard became Prime Minister, the number has been 38,504 on 596 boats. Hasn't this problem got much, much worse, not better, on Ms Gillard's watch? The order, the, the, the minister. Thank you. Mr President, those opposite continue to want to denigrate at every opportunity this government. That is, that is, their, that is their preferred position. They have no policy agenda of their own. No policy agenda, Mr. President, whatsoever. They don't want to use question time to ask about disability care, Mr. President. They don't want to. Order. S Senator Conroy, order. Just wait a minute. On my left, Senator Brandis is on his feet. Wait a minute, Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. On the question of direct relevance, Conceitedly, the primary question was broad and the minister was given a lot of latitude. But the su first supplementary question is only about the blowout in the number of irregular maritime arrivals on Ms Gillard's watch. It is neither directly nor even indirectly relevant for the minister merely to critique the question and abuse the opposition on topics that don't have anything to do with irregular maritime arrivals. Order. Senator Wong. Well, Mr. President, um, uh, as Senator Brandis himself conceded, uh, the prime order, order, only you, order. 
Order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. As Senator Brandis himself conceded, uh, this was a question, certainly the primary question, had a wide ambit. Uh, and, uh, and there was quite a lot of political rhetoric in uh, both of, uh, the quest primary question and the first supplementary. I think uh, Senator Brand is putting a question like that is uh, should anticipate getting a response which deals with some of the uh, refuting some of the political accusations that were included in the question. Order. I do order. I do draw the minister's attention to the question. The minister has 32 seconds remaining. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Rabbit has consistently said when it comes to the vote issues. It has been done before. It can be done again. But he has no workable plan, Mr. President, to actually achieve this objective. Before the 2010, before the 2010 election, the leader of the opposition said, and I quote, it's, we're, "In the end, it will be a prime ministerial decision." He said, "It will be the government's call, based on the advice of the naval commander on the spot." When it comes to turning Order. around Time the has expired. Senator Brandis. Given that the carbon tax, which Ms Gillard solemnly promised never to introduce, has had no impact on global temperatures, and the mining tax has collected negligible revenue, how does the government consider that those problems have been solved? Isn't it the case that the Gillard government has completely failed to achieve any of the outcomes? which Ms Gillard put forward as the justification for backstabbing an elected Prime Minister. Minister. <laughs> Mr President, Senator Brandis is suffering from amnesia. As some of the uh, interjections from behind me suggest, he must have been missing in the Cabinet decision when they took a policy position to price carbon. Must have been missing from that discussion, because those opposites signed up each and every one of them signed up to support a carbon price. Each and every one of them. Oh, subject to, subject to. You were in the room, Senator Abetz. I wasn't in the room. He wasn't in the cabinet. My apologies for defaming you or defaming your cabinet by suggesting you were. But, Mr. President, those opposite, those. Order. <laughs> Those opposite, Mr. President, have no genuine interest whatsoever in pricing carbon today. They have run an outrageous smear and lie and innuendo about the impact. The python. Remember the python. Remember Time all has of expired. the animals. Time's expired. S Senator Conroy, it's time. on my left. Senator Singh. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, Senator McLucas. Can the Minister inform the Senate how this government is supporting Australian families to meet the cost of raising a family? The uh, Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Honourable Senator for the question. The Gillard government is committed to building a fairer uh, uh, future for all Australian families. From next week, more than 1.3 million Australian families will receive the second instalment of the Gillard government's school kids bonus. From the 4th of July, eligible families will start receiving $205 for each child in primary school and $410 for each child in secondary school to help lighten the load for families facing back-to-school costs. In total, Australian families will receive about $1.3 billion in school kids bon bonus payments this year. The school kids bonus is just one of the ways our government is supporting Australians to meet the costs of raising a family. From next week, more than 1.6 million Australians will get a boost to their regular family payments. This means that for Australian families on low and middle incomes now receive up to $8,783 a year in support of a child in primary school, or more than $10,500 a year in support of a child in secondary school. Mr President, this is our way. This is the Labor way of helping Australian families who need it most, helping them with the costs of power bills, with petrol and the grocery bill. Mr President, around the country, Australian families have told our government how important these, the school kids bonus is to their family. But Mr Abbott has already told Australians that the school, kid, school kids bonus is on the chopping block. 
Mr Abbott is prepared to hurt 1.3 million families if he becomes Prime Minister. Mr President, the Gillard government is working to build a fairer, smarter and stronger Australia, where, where children are valued and uh, their education is supported, while the Liberals want to cut it Water, to the bone. Time's expired. Senator Singh. Mr President, supplementary. Can the minister update the Senate on how this government is helping Australians to make ends meet? The minister. Thank you, Mr President. The Gillard government is committed to investing in the future of Australian families, students and older Australians. Our government introduced Australia's first national paid parental leave scheme, providing a fair system to support parents to take time off to spend with their newborn child. Mr President, already 300,000 Australian families have ben benefited from the paid parental leave scheme. We've delivered an increase to the childcare rebate from 30 to 50 per cent of out-of-pocket costs, up to $7,500 per child per year. And we've introduced the school kids bonus, which those opposite have said they will axe if they win the election. We introduced the biggest dollar increase in the age pension in history and delivered the seniors work bonus, which means that older Australians can keep more of their pension when they work and we're delivering Disability Care Australia Order. to support Time's people expired. with Senator Singh. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Australian government is supporting Australian families in a clean energy future? The minister. Thank you, Mr President. The Gillard government is continuing to support Australian families, families, students and older Australians as we work toward a clean energy future. Since March of this year, more than 3.5 million pensioners, including age, disability and people on carer payment, have beginning, begun receiving their un, ongoing clean energy supplement as part of their fortnightly payments. Over a year, these pension increases are worth a total of more than $350 a year for singles and more than $530 a year for couples combined. Starting from this week, Students, youth al allowance recipients and, and pensioners receiving the quarterly supplement will also receive the clean energy payments as part of the household assistance package delivered by the Gillard government. We have delivered higher payments for families with teenagers to encourage them to stay in school and delivered three rounds of tax cuts in our first three budgets. Order. Time's expired. Senator Ronaldson. Nobody listened to anything you have to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Or, or, or I refer to, to the commitment uh, given Senator, by Senator Ronaldson, just resume your seat. Order. 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 Sen Senator. Order. Order. Senator Ronaldson is entitled. Order. Senator, Ron Senator Ronaldson is in No, I'll give you the call. You are entitled, like every other senator, Senator Ronaldson, to be heard in silence. On my right. Order. 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 Senator Ronaldson, start again. Thank you, Mr. President. I thought the, thought the full moon was waning. Uh, my question is the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer to the commitments given by the Prime Minister at the press conference three years and one day ago after she enrolled Mr. Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister. At that press conference, the Prime Minister said, Today, I can assure every Australian their budget will be back in surplus in 2013 and that she would provide strong management of our borders and that she would lead a strong and responsible government. Given that three years later the budget remains in deficit, our borders are open to any boat that happens to come along, and the cabinet is split asunder, wrecked by disunity, backstabbing and leaking, why would anyone believe that if re-elected, another Labor Green government would be any different to this one? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Mr President, as I said at that first press conference, and I quote again, the Prime Minister 
replied, my priority as we look through the issues of the government is to make sure that in every area we are working hard for Australian families. We are working hard for those Australians who work hard themselves, who set the alarm clock early, who get up in the morning, get the kids to school, and I'll keep saying it, and to work hard and work hard. I want to make sure we are working with them. Well, Mr President, as I was saying earlier, we have delivered a triple A credit rating. We have saved 200,000 jobs through the global financial crisis. And the Labor government is proud of its record of six years of achievement, Mr President. The Prime Minister is getting on with the job, keeping our economy strong, spreading jobs, opportunity and fairness, Mr President, and helping Order. modern Sen families. Sen Sen Order. Order. Sen wait. Um, Senator Heffernan is on his feet on both sides. Senator Heffernan. Um, understanding orders, does he have to read it? Order. You think he'd know there's it no, reading no it? point of order. There's no point of order. There's no point. When there's silence, we'll proceed. When there's silence, we'll proceed. On both sides, when there's silence, we'll proceed. When there's silence, we'll proceed. No. Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Prime Minister has provided unprecedented, unprecedented support for modern families. The school kids bonus, new payments for families with teenagers, more family tax benefit, record support for childcare and help with costs like taking kids to the dentist. Mr President, under Prime Minister Gillard, we have finalised the health agreement, which is more doctors, more nurses, more beds, less waiting, less waste, with better accountability and community control. We have invested, Mr President, in mental health. Our $2.2 billion package is delivering additional services and a greater focus on prevention and early intervention, Mr. President. Order. We have put a Time price on carbon. Time has expired. Order. When there's silence, Senator Ronaldson, I'll give you the call. There's not, there's not silence, Senator Ronaldson, so you'll need to wait. Senator, when there's silence, Senator Ronaldson, you'll get the call. Senator Ronaldson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the Minister, is there any deal the Prime Minister would not do with the Greens or independents in order to retain government following the next election? The, the Minister. <laughs> Mr President, we will continue to deliver jobs. We will continue to support our three billion uh, jobs and skills package. Uh, and Mr President, those opposite who simply simply want to come in here and throw mud and to smear and to not debate policy. When you have an opportunity to ask questions in this chamber, Mr. President, here now on Senator Brandis. Order. President, the answer is not directly relevant to the question. The question only asked whether the government was prepared to do any deal with the Greens to retain power. So the only answer that can be relevant is an answer that addresses the relationship between the government and the Greens. This answer does not address that topic. Senator Wong. President, I'm sure most Australians will be disappointed to know that the opposition doesn't believe jobs for Australians are important. But we on this side do think that is relevant to a question about the priorities of the government. Order. I'm listening. Order. The minister has. Uh, still 32 seconds remaining. I'm listening closely to the minister's answer. The minister, uh, you need to answer the question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we will continue to champion jobs and in through to the election, and we will continue after the election, Mr. President, to vote to support jobs in this country. And we will. We, we would one day hope. We would one day hope we could get those opposite to vote with us after the election to support jobs. 
not to try and put 200,000 Australians on the unemployment queue Order. like they did Order. last time. Order. Sen Order. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr President. On a point of order, direct relevance, the sessional orders require a minister's answer to be directly relevant. The question was very specific in relation to whether or not there was any deal that the current government would not do with the Greens to retain power. Now, uh, Senator Conroy can talk about all other manner of things, but uh, as he's doing, but clearly doing so, is not being relevant, let alone directly relevant to the question asked. The minister has order. The minister has six seconds remaining. I do draw the minister's attention to the question in those six seconds. The Thank minister. You. It's either yes or no. Those opposite want to write their own answers to their own fantasy questions, Mr. President. Order. Time's expired. Order. Order. Senator Ronaldson. Thank you, Mr. President. On the back of my primary question, Minister, given the chaos and dysfunction of the last three years, why should anyone believe that if re elected another Labor government would be any different to this one? The, the Minister. The Minister. And Mr President, what I can guarantee you if, when we're re-elected is that we will continue to support a resilient economy that is outperforming the rest of the developed world. We will continue to provide that leadership and strength of direction. We will continue to get steady growth in the economy, making it 14 per cent bigger now than we were when we came to government, with a forecast of two and three quarter percent growth. We will continue to deliver on that leadership. S Senator, we will continue. Just, just resume your seat. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. When there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Conroy. So, Mr. President. Senator Conroy, just resume your seat. When there's silence, we'll continue. Senator Conroy. Mr President, thank you. We will continue to provide the exceptional job creation record that we have delivered. And the February employment data showed that over 950,000 jobs have been created since Labor came to office, despite 28 million jobs lost worldwide. And those economic flat earthers over there, Mr President, Order. who interject Senator about Conroy, that, your have... time has expired. No, I'll give you the call when there's silence, Senator Di Natale. You're entitled to be heard in silence. Order. 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 On my right, Senator Di Natale is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is for the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. And I'm asking this question on behalf of ALSAE, an independent community organisation aiming to revitalise participation in Australian democracy. And our democracy could sure do with some revitalisation at the moment. The ALSAE People's Question is voted on by the Australian public. To ask the question. Uh, the Our Say People's Question is voted on by the public on the Our Say uh, website, and the top-rated question chosen was, uh, Minister, uh, Australia's scheduling of illicit drugs is based on historical precedent rather Order. than any— Order. Senator Di Natale, resume your seat. Now, when there's silence on my left, we'll proceed. Senator Di Natale. Uh, Minister, Australia's scheduling of illicit drugs is based on historical precedent rather than any objective measure of harm, and evidence shows some illegal drugs are less harmful than alcohol to users and society, with most harm a direct result of their illicit status. Uh, we seem set to repeat the same mistakes in our approach to synthetic drugs. So the question is, what's Australia doing to address this unscientific classification of drugs and the, ne and the resulting unnecessary harm? Order, order. When there's when there's silence, on my left, Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
Mr. President, illicit, and could I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, Mr. President, illicit drug use is a high risk activity and has been proved to contribute to social, economic and personal harms. New psychoactive substances are emerging that pose a serious risk to both consumers and the broader community because little is known about their short or long-term health effects and the exact ingredients are also often unknown. The response of all Australian governments to illicit drugs is focused on implementing the National Drug Strategy 2010 to 2015, which provides a framework for action on alcohol, tobacco and other drugs guided by the principle of harm minimisation. The strategy is aimed at improving the health, social and economic outcomes for Australians by preventing the uptake of harmful drug use and reducing the harmful effects of illicit and illicit drugs in our society. The need to control certain drugs is also recognised at the international level, and the Australian Government has ratified a number of international agreements that require the criminalisation of these drugs. Senator Dean Natale. Um, supplementary question also rated highly by the public on the RSA website. Uh, Minister, given that law enforcement policies are harming more people than the drugs themselves in many instances and often result in more crime, with recent media reports demonstrating that the illicit drug market is now conservatively estimated at $7 billion per annum, uh, when will this government change its, currently, uh, its current approach, which is uh, expensive and has failed in terms of targeting end users, and begin treating this as a health issue? Order. Order the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the government remains strongly committed to protecting the public from the health and safety risks associated with drug use, balancing health responses with effective law enforcement. The response, as I've mentioned, of all Australian governments to illicit drugs is focused on implementing the National Drug Strategy 2010 2015, which, as I've also said, provides a framework for action on alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs guided by the principle of harm minimisation and which has been recognised as a world leading initiative to combine both health and law enforcement responses. Senator Dean Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Final supplementary question asked by the users of our say. Uh, recently, a New South Wales parliamentary report recommended allowing the medical use of cannabis under certain circumstances. Uh, would the federal government support a change to the illicit drug classification of cannabis to allow it to be tested and developed for medical use? The Minister. Uh, Mr President, uh, cannabis is a depressant drug which slows activity in the central nervous system and has been linked to a number of me mental illnesses including depression, anxiety and psychosis. The Australian Government does not support the legalisation of cannabis, and there is no consideration being given to changing its current status as a prohibited drug under Australian law. Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Does the minister share the views of the member for Chifley, who last week responded to the manifest failure of the current strategy for rolling out the national broadband network by urging that Telstra undertake a larger role? Does the minister agree that greater utilisation of existing construction expertise would have been one practical way of turning his weekend admission of being only reasonably certain that NBN Co will meet its June 30 targets? into a much higher level of certainty. The Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Minister for Broadband Communications, the thank Digital you. Economy, thank you, Senator Mr. Conroy. President, and, uh, could I thank Senator Birmingham for being uh, able to get a question up uh, through the uh, Tactics Committee. Uh, the, those opposite, Mr. Those opposite, those, op those opposite profess to care about the rollout of the national broadband network. Mr President, those opposite have sought at every turn to impede and get in the way, slow down the rollout of the network. The only threat to the national broadband network meeting its rollout targets, Mr President, is those opposite. 
The policy that they have released, Mr. President, will result in nine million Australian homes and businesses being disconnected from Labor's NBN. Disconnected. Mr. President, I am confident that NBN Co will reach its revised June fibre forecast for premises passed. As I have said on numerous occasions, Mr. President, the, the monthly construction updates that NBNCO posts on its website are provided for information purposes and are intended to be a guide only. And they state quite specifically. So, Mr. President, those opposite who have spent their time trolling around looking for every piece of disinformation on the net, I'd advise you, and I mentioned this to you, and I mentioned this to you in estimates. There's a very, very good uh, website produced by a 16-year-old kid who has done more research and created a, a website that provides more information than you've done in three years of your efforts at Senate estimates. He simply sat down and designed it himself. He is 16 years old, and he could tell you more about the government's, more about the government's NBN Co rollout than they, those opposite, every single one of them. But it is good to see. It is good to see that they Order. finally worked out, Time's Mr. President. Expired. Now, when there is silence, we will proceed. Senator Heffernan, one of yours is on their feet, waiting to ask a supplementary question. Order. 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 Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that it was little more than blind ideological prejudice on the part of the Labor government and NBN senior management that precluded a greater utilisation of existing construction expertise in the rollout, such as that suggested by your own, Mr. Husick, and of course utilising those skills, such as those of companies like Telstra? The minister. Mr. President, once again, Senator Birmingham spreads misinformation to the Australian public and to this chamber, because the construction process actually went through a tender process. A tender process. And Telstra were entitled to apply like every other company. And going through that process, what happened was that NBN Co got the best value for Australian taxpayers. So if Telstra did or didn't apply, I'm not familiar with uh, all of the information around the tender process, but the tenders were properly run under government guidelines. And so far, Mr. President, this year, MBN Co has been switched on all over the country, including Aspley, Bacchus Marsh, Blacktown, Coffs Harbour, Darwin, Gosford, Gungarlan, Hobart, Launceston, Toowoomba and Townsville, and to over 300 new developments all over the country. But many more areas, Mr. President, will be Order. being turned Time on in the very expired. near future. Time's expired. Just... Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Further supplementary. Given the minister's complete failure to meet his own NBN targets, will the minister confirm his promise to go to the backbench if Mr. Rudd is returned to the prime ministership? And has this promise resulted in a surge in support for Mr Rudd in caucus, with the minister succeeding where Mr Crean and Mr Shorten and both Senators Carr and indeed allegedly Senator Wong have all failed in delivering a knockout blow to Ms Gillard's leadership? Order. 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 When there's, when there's silence on both sides. I need silence on both Just wait a minute, Senator Conroy. No, Senator Conroy, you haven't got the call. You'll get the call when there's silence on both sides. When there's, when there's silence on both sides, order, order. When there's silence on both sides. If you wish to debate the issue, you know that the time to debate the issue is after three o'clock. On both sides. Senator Conroy. Mr. President, the withering attack on the national broadband network from those opposites couldn't even make three questions. It made about two and a half questions before we had to wander off into politics. Because the only threat, Mr. President, 
to all Australians getting access to the national broadband network are those opposite. They want, they want under their policy, if you want to get connected to Labor's NBN, they want you to pay up to $5,000 per home, up to $5,000 per home to connect to Labor's NBN, or you are going to be disconnected from it. Up to $5,000. And if, for those who are watching the ABC News in the last two nights, you might have noticed Malcolm Turnbull refused to be interviewed Order. last you night. Need to refer Mr. To Turnbull, thank you, Mr. President. Place. Mr. Thank Turnbull you. refused to be interviewed because he didn't want to try and explain how he was going to use pixie dust to make Australia's copper network deliver at the speeds that those opposite are promising. Because they know at the end of the day their policy Order. is fraud. Time has expired. Time's expired. Now, when there's, when there's silence, we'll, we will proceed. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the listing of up to 170,000 hectares of Tasmania's unique forest wilderness on the World Heritage Reg Register helps to protect jobs in the Tasmanian Order. forest industry? Order. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Brown for her continued interest in the conservation in Tasmania. But I was pleased to be in Tasmania to welcome the passage of the legislation through uh, the uh, through the Tasmanian Parliament of the uh, forestry legislation. Uh, why? Because that legislation is about not only the conservation of uh, forestry in Tasmania, but also it locks in jobs. Uh, it's the culmination of an incredible amount of work, Good hard you. work by community representatives, uh, and it will help resolve the debate that has uh, been in Tasmania about the forest industry in Tasmania. Uh, but it's also a desire from those community representatives to see those twin outcomes, both jobs and conservation of Tasmanian native forests. The facts are clear, Mr President. The data has been telling us that the Tasmanian industry has been severely impacted by the global financial crisis, by, by uh, wood products due to the global financial crisis, changing market preferences and the high dollar. And only a year ago, a Taran Tasmania announced that it was reducing output and reducing staff. And on the weekend we saw, on the weekend we saw Taran Tasmania announce its commitment to a secure future for more than 90 direct jobs in the region, uh, their families and businesses that supply Taran. That's 90 more jobs uh, who have a future that, that, the industry, uh, that the industry wants, that the coalition are bleating about. They don't want jobs in Tasmania. Uh, the agreement was delivering outcomes for Tasmania. The nomination of the World Heritage Listing has seen groups like the Australian Conservation Foundation work with industry in overseas markets, uh, in export markets, to show Tasmanian forest products are sustainable, legally harvested and top quality. And I won't ignore uh, the Forest Industry Association of Tasmania, Order. who says— Order. Your time's expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Mr President. A supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Gillard government's constructive approach to forestry in Tasmania encourages investment in jobs in Tasmania? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank, uh, Sen I thank Senator Brown for a continued interest in creating jobs and opportunity in Tasmania. And as part of the Tasmanian Forest Intergovernmental Agreement and the Commonwealth, it committed $120 million for economic diversification over 15 years. In 2012, 24 million in funding and assistance for a range of economic diversification projects. Uh, they include Tasmanian Innovation and Investment Fund, 8 million for 28 businesses, creating uh, 267 jobs. Economic diversification projects, uh, including 16 million for 10 projects. And on the 17th of May, the Prime Minister announced that the government would increase the economic diversification funding to 100 million to be delivered over four years. These things being delivered in Tasmania because of the changes in the economy, including changes in the forest industry, and because the Gillard government has listened to industry. The Jobs and Growth Plan will bring new opportunities. Expired. Time has expired. Senator Brown. Thank you. Uh, second supplementary. Can the minister advise the Senate? If he is aware of any alternative approaches to, uh, 
approaches to protecting jobs, protecting the environment and creating community consensus on the future of Tasmania. Does the minister know of any risks to the government's plan to lock in jobs? The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Carol Brown. And of course, there are risks. If you look at the words from the opposition, the Tasmanian forestry industry should be extremely wary of the approach of Tasmanians like the Liberals, like Senator Colbeck, on the same day as Taran, a Tasmania put out a statement committing to that state for another five years. The Tasmanian Liberal uh, Peter uh, Gwent accused the Gillard government of buying forestry jobs. Senator Colbeck, on the other hand, is on the record complaining that the money is being paid to shrink the Tasmanian economy. Uh, Mr. President, this is about growing jobs in Tasmania. Those opposite don't want to support it. They've got, they're ideologically stuck in a rut on Tasmania. It's a rut that wouldn't see, would see continued conflict in Tasmania. It would see the Tasmanian forest industry uh, decline uh, in its commitment to attack jobs in Tasmania. Senator Colbeck has more in common with Senator Mill than he cares Order. to admit. Time's, time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Uh, minister, we're constantly told just wa by Just the wait a minute, Senator Macdonald. You, you are entitled on both sides. Senator Macdonald is on his feet. He deserves to be heard in silence. Senator Macdonald, you will be heard in silence. Order on my right. Senator Macdonald. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, my question to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. We're constantly told by the Prime Minister that the carbon tax is good for Australia and indeed good for the world. Why then did the Prime Minister three years ago solemnly promise never to introduce a carbon tax uh, under any government uh, she led? Uh, did she uh, three years ago not understand just, just what wait, now... wait, wait a minute, Senator Macdonald. I can understand or, why they're trying to drown order. me out, Mr. President. Order. Order. Senator Macdonald, continue. Did she not three years ago understand what she now claims are the great benefits of the carbon tax? Uh, if that's not the explanation, why then did she break in spectacular style, in spectacular fashion, the promise never to introduce a carbon tax? Mr Minister, why would the Australian public and Australian families now ever believe anything the Prime Minister might say at the next election or any other time? In order, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr President. It is. Uh, pleasing to see Senator Macdonald asking a question on policy, Mr. President, because now we're back to the staple of those opposites: right. the misinformation, the lies, and the deceit of the Australian public. Because what we have opposite there, Mr. President, is the Python is back, the wrecking ball is back, Wyala is off the face of the earth. All of that will remember. All of those. I'm not going to sing, though. You're all safe. I won't sing. But uh, those opposite have, day after day after day, misled the Australian public about the impact of the carbon pricing. It is, it is Mr President, this fear-mongering about the impact of the carbon price has become understood by the public. It is just scaring people for your own short-term political gain. Climate Institute research published on the weekend the Climate Institute research published on the weekend shows that Australians have seen through you. They have seen through you and your scare tactics. The world, the world has not ended as forecast because of carbon pricing. In fact, Mr President, the public support Australia taking action on climate change and are quite worried if elected Mr Rabbit won't. Mr. Mr. President, the coalition has always been an absolute shambles 
when it comes to this policy issue. When it comes to action on climate change, absolutely nothing has changed. They don't know if they're pro or anti the, the uh, climate change policy that they have. They don't know whether they are for or against emissions trading schemes or even renewable energy. We all know they, should they gain government, they will not repeal Order. the carbon Time price. Order. Time has expired. Order. Time's expired. Order. Order. When there's silence on both sides, on both, on both sides, Senator. Order. Both, on both sides, Senator Macdonald. Mr President, I asked the Minister, is the Climate Commission that he talks about led by a person who two weeks before the greatest floods that ever hit Brisbane promised there'd never be another drop of rain in southern, south-eastern Queensland? And does the Minister believe that the Australian tax of next week to be $24.15 a tonne is beneficial to Australia when uh, Europe, which emits about five times as much carbon, has a carbon tax of only $5.84 per tonne. Order, the minister. Thank you, Mr. President. As I was saying, we all know that should those opposite gain government, they will not repeal the carbon price because it is the cheapest and most efficient system, and it is working. A 7.4 reduction in emissions in the national electricity market in the first 11 months. Australia's economy and employment has continued to grow. Over 158,000 jobs have been added to the economy since the introduction of the carbon price, despite the global financial crisis. Mr. President. Mr. President, we all recognise price impacts have been modest. Just resume your seat. On both sides, we need silence. Sen order, order, Senator, Senator Conroy. Mr. President, we all recognise price impacts have been modest, and households are getting assistance with payments and tax cuts. But, Mr. President, you cannot trust those opposite and what they say. They say we are acting alone. Australia order. is Your not time acting has expired. alone. Time's expired. Order. Senator Macdonald. Mr President, can I ask the Minister to explain, or for the Prime Minister to explain, how Australian manufacturers are meant to compete against manufacturers in the USA, which has no nationwide carbon tax, and China, which has no effective carbon tax at all? And uh, can the Minister explain how many jobs in manufacturing have been lost as a result of the government's carbon tax? Water. The order, the minister. Let's just ignore the high dollar. Just ignore that. It's got no impact whatsoever, Senator Macdonald. But, Mr. President, as I said, and Senator Macdonald just alluded to it, Australia is not, despite your question, acting alone on climate change. An OECD report, Mr. President, confirms that an effective carbon tax applies to pollution from energy in every single OECD country. The 27 countries of the EU have an ETS. California and the northeastern states have an ETS. China launched its first emission trading scheme last week, Mr. President. Japan has had a carbon tax since 2012. South Korea has had a scheme, Mr. President, for years. India has put a price on carbon for coal. And New Zealand, Mr. President, a Conservative government, has an ETS. So it's great news for the planet as carbon pricing grows and grows throughout the global Order. economy. Order. Time has expired. Order. Senator Wright. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Lundy, representing the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Are Minister Garrett's comments today that there are still high levels of bullying in Australian schools and legalising same-sex marriage could spare some Australian teenagers from bullying on the basis of sexual orientation, based on the recognition that improving policy protections and setting an example through federal laws is a way to reduce these young people's risk of homophobic bullying? The Minister representing the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Cinder Lundy. 
Um, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can I say to uh, the senator, we are, of course, committed to the highest possible standards of education in Australia. This is reflected uh, in uh, our vision for school improvement, our national plan for school improvement. And I know the minister has made several statements across a range of topics, such as those you've described in your question, to this effect. Whilst I don't have a specific brief on the issues that you raise. I am able to say that uh, through the National Plan for School Improvement, the additional resources provided to schools will allow for a range of, um, I suppose, improved resources in individual schools to allow these kinds of issues to be addressed. And by improving uh, the ability of each school to take on issues beyond just the curriculum and provided a standard of care and education uh, that is as yet unseen in our generation, Mr. President, is something I'm extremely proud of. In fact, one of, the, uh, one of the, the motivations behind our national plan for school improvement is to uh, take the opportunity that we have as a Labor government uh, to make what is effectively a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change the face of education, understanding that by investing in our young people, we are preparing this nation for the future in a way that is uh, unable to be compared with any previous investment. In fact, so much so that our National Plan for Schools Improvement um, is the single largest investment in school education that Australia has ever seen. Uh, and by, by making that investment, I think we show not only those opposite uh, up as far as uh, our um, respective policies go, but they are yet, at least in this place, to get behind our vision for our national plan for school improvement, uh, despite the fact that we've had several what premiers. Water time's expired. Um, that Senator, time's expired. Senator Wright. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Thank the minister for her answer. A supplementary question. Given that there are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex students in every education system in Australia, including religious schools, does the government agree that the way to reduce bullying against LGBTI youth, no matter which school they are enrolled in, if that school receives public monies, would be to require all schools to comply with federal anti-discrimination law? The Minister. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, with respect to the, the application of the anti-discrimination laws, uh, I would certainly um, defer to my colleagues uh, in the House, the respective minister, both the Attorney General and indeed the Minister for Education, for specific policy statements in that regard. I don't have them in my brief before me, but I am again incredibly proud of the fact that I'm part of a government that has made um, substantial steps in removing discrimination against uh, uh, gay and lesbian people and the Order. discrimination they face within the, the Australian community. Uh, in fact, um, it has been the Labor government that has taken the most substantive steps in this regard with several pieces of legislation to remove this discrimination. Senator Wright. Yes, thank you, Mr President. For the supplementary question, does the government agree with the Shadow Attorney General's statement last night that anti-discrimination laws should not be universal because freedom of religion supersedes freedom from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? And if not, will the government join with the Australian Greens in standing up for the human rights of our students and support our amendment to the Australian Education Act that all schools receiving public funding must comply with federal anti-discrimination laws? Good question. Order. 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 Senator Lundy. Yeah, thank you. Um, in response to that question, I don't think I can add any more to my initial answers. I think it is clearly uh, a specific Order. policy in relation to attorney generals and discrimination. I will say that as far as our uh, general approach to um, the fight against discrimination in all its forms, whether it's on the basis of, of sexual orientation, whether it's the, on the basis of race, whether it's on the, on the basis of religion, um, is uh, incredibly uh, well developed and something we're very proud of. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. I refer the Minister to the serious drought crisis in northern Australian cattle industry, which threatens the life of one million, one million cattle if rain doesn't arrive by the end of the year. 
1969, when Queensland was in severe drought, the Australian government made Shoalwater Bay Army Training Area available to the Queensland government for use of emergency grazing land for cattle. Given that decision was well appreciated at the time, will the government make Shoalwater Bay and Dotswood Station and Townsville Field Training Area available for grazing for starving cattle that will perish if relief is not forthcoming? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. President. Defence training, and thank you, the Senator, for his question. Defence training areas, particularly Shoalwater Bay training area and Townsville Field training area, are critical assets to the defence capability. The scale and scope of training activities and the training area to support those activities has changed considerably since 1969. Shoalwater Bay training area may be available for the grazing of cattle for limited time frames and in limited sectors. Accordingly, the government would need to consider any use of Shoalwater Bay training area for grazing on a case-by-case -case basis. The decision to allow cattle to graze on defence land would probably be progressed as a defence assistance to the civil community request. The approving authority for a DACC request is the Minister for Defence or Chief of the Defence Force. As yet, neither have received a request from the Newman government. Mr President, the Queensland government's reaction to the plight of drought-stricken grazers is just a litany of mismanagement. Even in the awful millennium drought, nobody grazed their cattle in our national parks, and the Queensland government is simply looking for an excuse, simply looking for an excuse to cover up its own ongoing mismanagement. Send order, Senator Boswell. Um, I refer the minister to the Prime Minister's announcement that she will travel to Indonesia next week. Will the Prime Minister apologise to the Indonesian government for its decision to restrict food supplies to Indonesia by shutting down the live cattle trade, a decision which was substantially contributed to the suffering of Australian cattle producers today? The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the action this government took last year was appropriate and weighed and balanced all of the issues involved. involved. And what we've seen is significant reform in that area over the last 12 months. So I reject utterly the imputation of Mr. Senator Boswell's question, Mr. Mr. President. But uh, I'm not sure if there's anything further I can add on that matter. Order, Senator Boswell. My uh, third supplementary question. I refer the minister to a letter in the Sydney Morning Herald, published on the 6th of June 2011, and co-signed by Senator Bob Carr, in which he organised voiceless, which an organisation voiceless called on the government to end the live cattle trade. As Senator Bob Carr remains a council member of the organisation Voices, how can the government credibly claim that it, recommends, uh, it remains committed to the northern cattle producers when its foreign minister is clearly against the industry? In order, the, the uh, minister. But thank you. Well, Mr. President, I, I reject the premise this government is committed. This is committed, uh, this government, to ensuring animal welfare and getting the balances right. The Gillard government is committed to the livestock export trade where acceptable animal welfare outcomes can be achieved. The Gillard government implemented the Exporter Supply Chain Assurance System, known as ESCAS, to secure a future for the livestock export trade. This is a trade that supports jobs, families and communities throughout Australia. The Gillard government has implemented the highest animal welfare standards for exported livestock anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. Without making these key reforms to the live export trade, it would not exist today. By placing animal welfare at the heart of the trade, the Gillard government has ensured the trade has a future. And could I uh, thank Senator Boswell? That was possibly your last question uh, in your long and meritorious career. Order. 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 Order.
Senator Stirl. Been up here. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Can the Minister update the Senate on the situation on the ground in Sri Lanka? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Carr. Mr. President, after 30 years of civil conflict, Sri Lanka was a traumatised nation when fighting between government forces and Tamil separatists ended four years ago. Suicide bombing was invented during this period of insurgency. Children were conscripted. Women and children were used as shields. Religious monuments were blown up. Tens of thousands of people were killed. Thousands of homes destroyed. Half a million people internally displaced. It went largely unreported. And that makes all the more remarkable and hopeful the reconstruction that is being taking place in the country. It's noteworthy that nearly 11,000 former Tamil Tiger fighters have been reintegrated and all former child soldiers have been released. Reconstruction is underway with 2,000 square kilometres of land having been cleared of mines. Freedom of movement has improved and gross domestic product was up 6.4 per cent in 2012. Serious concerns, however, do remain. More needs to be done to account for abuses by both sides and to help displaced people return to their homes. Media and civil society are still constrained in Sri Lanka, and there needs to be a commitment to an independent judicial system that was undermined by the impeachment of the Chief Justice. I raised the matter with the External Affairs Minister Peris in January and expressed Australian concern. Further progress is essential for genuine reconciliation and responsibility rests with the government of Sri Lanka. We've never ceased to raise these matters when we've engaged with the government of Sri Lanka. In December, I raised these matters with President Rajapaksa and said that Australia looks forward to the full implementation of the Sri Lankan government's own lessons learnt and reconciliation commission report. We have a legitimate interest in these things. Time's expired. Senator Stirl. Well, thanks, Mr. President. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister advise the Senate what Australia is doing to encourage further progress on the human rights situation in Sri Lanka? Minister. Mr. President, the, uh, the matter is all about accountability and about the implementation of the human rights benchmarks that the government of Sri Lanka has subscribed to itself. Uh, last week I had an opportunity to speak directly to External Affairs Minister Peres, who was visiting Australia. Um, I, uh, I, with our High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, Robin Moody, moved through an agenda that listed our continuing concerns. Um, they involved the question of resettlement and land ownership in the north of the country. They involve full accountability for the offences committed by both sides during the period that the civil war came, the insurre insurrection, I should say, rather than civil war, came to its conclusion. Australia, of course, co-sponsored resolutions on reconciliation and accountability in Sri Lanka in the UN Human Rights Council in 2012 and 2013. Time's expired. Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do thank the minister once again for that answer. Uh, minister, can you update the Senate on Australia's contribution to post-conflict recovery and development in Sri Lanka? The minister. Mr. President, uh, based on our view that engagement not isolation is the most effective way of improving human rights and the rule of law in the country. We uh, we are proud to report that we have invested more than $180 million in humanitarian and development assistance since the end of the conflict in May 2009. Uh, we have provided support for demining and reconstruction of housing and schools. We have trained and uh, extended loans to 4,000 women who are the heads of their households, to get them into small business, earning their own livelihood, supporting their families. We have provided uh, safe drinking water and new sanitation facilities for over 6,000 tea estate workers and their families. This financial year alone, Australia contributed $42.6 million, and this includes support for better quality education and to improve the incomes of 3,500 fishing families by building new infrastructure. Order. Time's expired. Senator Conroy. Uh, Mr President, could I uh, ask that further questions be placed on that?
Senator Conroy. Uh, Mr Deputy President, for the information of the Senate, I table additional advice on a question asked to me yesterday by Senator Milne. I seek leave to incorporate the information into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Boswell. I move to take note of uh, a question that I asked from Senator Conroy about the live cattle. Mr Acting Deputy President, the live cattle ban was placed in June uh, 2011. And I actually feel sorry for Senator Ludwig sometimes because I don't believe that he uh, really wanted this, but he was overridden by his party and he has been made to look completely inept and weak because he ha has not ever been able to stand up to the Environmental Department and other ministers that um, override him. It was, a, it was due to a perfect storm. The dollar was high, there was a drought, and then a ban on live cattle. That has, the repercussions of that has been felt right across northern Australia, across northern, northwestern Australia, the Australian Territory, Northern Territory, and North Queensland. I have seen stations come on the market now that have gone broke. They are just holding out holding out to see if something turns up. Stations that haven't, haven't changed hands for 100 years are going on the market, and the price is so depressed. The ban shattered the confidence of the Indonesian authorities. They relied on Australia. They thought they were honourable people. They couldn't believe that someone would just cut off their protein supply in, in, a, in a matter of a, of a couple of days. They couldn't believe it. Now, I was one that went over to Indonesia to try and sort this mess out about a, two weeks after it happened. And the Indonesians are always terribly polite, but they was, I could see they were so disappointed, so shattered by what we had done to them. They trusted us and we let them down badly. We've lost 700. Well, initially we were exporting 770,000 head of cattle, the value of $480 million. In 2010, that went down to 520,000, um, $320 million. But after the ban took place, we just exported 278,000, under, well under half of what we had, the value of $188 million. The Indonesian cut, cut their quota uh, from uh, in 2013 down to 267,000 head. They believed they had to be self-sufficient in the cattle industry because they could no longer trust us as a number one supplier. And the hurt, and the agony, and the financial hurt that you have caused, or the Labor Party has caused, because they marched to the Greens. But, uh, Band has been unbelievable out there. I have never seen such devastation. And it wouldn't have been so bad if you could have got rid of the cattle somewhere else. But what, what in fact happened, the cattle, the 8% of the cattle live exports that should have gone overseas, were forced back onto the market. It's a question of supply and demand. And um, when that 8% hit the market, it dragged down the price of the cattle, the cattle that were meant for the domestic and export markets overseas in Box B. But no one ever thought about that. And that's the trouble with the Labor Party. They never think about the repercussions that are going to happen. They never think about what's going to happen on a carbon tax. They never think a carbon tax for $600, $400 on a car of a carbon tax is going to have any effect. And Mr Oliver, in charge of the union, demands that the Labor Party uh, can't penalise or the workers shouldn't be penalised. They shouldn't be penalised. But why do you guys insist on putting $400 on a car, on a carbon tax, and expect the car to be able to sell in Australia? And it's the same thing with the Indonesian um, cattle industry. No one even thinks of the repercussions. You've halved the trade in 2000, since 2010. The industry is dire. Indonesia doesn't trust us. And what a way to start being the food bowl of the world by just, with one stroke of a pen, pulling the rug out from Indonesia and saying, righto, there's no more meat coming in and um, 
you'll have to go and do what you eat fish or eat chicken or whatever you eat. The industry believes that there's probably a million cattle out there that should have been exported, should have gone overseas, should have got on the boats, but they're out there now in the stations where they haven't been able to get rid of that year's cattle and they're doubling up. There's not enough feed and um, <coughs> consequently the grazers are going out and having to shoot Thank you, Senator Boswell. Your time has expired. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Um, before I commence my uh, con contribution to uh, this debate, I should echo the remarks of uh, Senator Conroy. It's probably Senator Boswell's last take note, so I congratulate him on a long and successful career in this place. Order, order, now, order Senator Bishop. A point of order, Senator Boswell. Your comments, but I won't be retiring till June 2014. Thank you. It's not a point of order, Senator Boswell, but thank you for that clarification. Sen Senator Bishop, you have the call. In that case, I still will not withdraw my remarks. I'll just adjourn them to another time. Um, <laughs> Senator Heffernan, I do know a lot of things, and I know about this. What I was going to say in my opening comments, uh, Mr Deputy President, that when decisions are made, as Senator Boswell said, there are consequences and there are repercussions. And I don't for one moment concede that this hasn't been a most difficult issue, a difficult issue in Queensland, a difficult issue in the Northern Territory and a difficult issue in Western Australia. It's affected the owners of the properties in those places. It's affected the workers on those stations, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. It's affected those who are active and participate and make a, an income from participating in the trade. But when the scandal or the TV footage was released and caused an immense reaction right across Australia, out of the blue, our government took decisions affecting the live cattle trade that did have consequences and did have reper repercussions. And we don't for one moment at any time resile from that decision we made and implemented. Because always since that decision was made, we had one core purpose in mind. That is, we wanted to have a strong, viable, sustainable, live cow, live sheep, live product meat export industry out of this country. That's what we wanted then, that's what we wanted now, and most importantly in this discussion, that is what we have now. That is what we have now. All of our markets have been restored. Sheep, cows, cattle, goat are being exported in larger and larger numbers. And the significant community opposition that did exist and brought this to media attention has dropped right off. So one asks the question, in the context of consequences and repercussions by which Senator Boswell opened this discussion, what are the consequences and what are the, what are the repercussions? We now have order, an industry order, Senator strong— Bishop. Senator Heffernan, a point of order. order. It's misleading the Senate to be factually incorrect about what's no. happening in the market. Senator, now. Hef down Senator the Heffernan, market that is not a point of order. There is no point of order, Senator Heffernan. Senator Bishop, you have the call. I thank you, Mr. Deputy and President. Just, just before you continue, Senator Bishop, and Senator Heffernan, you have the opportunity to seek the call uh, shortly if you wish to contribute to the debate. And I suggest you save your comments to that point in time. Senator Bishop, you have the call. Mr. Deputy President, what I was saying was that, in the context of Senator Boswell's introductory re remarks, that there are consequences and repercussions. And yes, there are. The markets that we had have been restored. The customers that we had have come back here. Our exporters are engaged in the business they were, and we have growing trade, both in terms of volume and in terms of prices received for the export of cattle and sheep and other products out of this country. So we, have, we are proud of the outcome. We say, we say, and we don't for one moment ever say, that export industry doesn't play an important part in our economy. The industry provides jobs for Order. thousands of people station owners, 
Indigenous workers, non-Indigenous. In addition to ensuring food security for many countries across the world, not least of which, of course, is those, are those in our near neighbours of Indonesia, which rely heavily on meat and the protein that makes up the base of it. But since the ESCAP arrangements have come into place, the new framework that has been established, let's put some facts on the table. Over 2.35 over million sheep, over 800,000 cattle and over 40,000 goats have been exported under the ESCAP arrangements. And as we come into the season and one looks at the export season and one looks at the forecasts and the trend lines for tonnage to be exported, it's up and up and up because we have an industry now that has got guaranteed markets where competition can't meet the product we offer, where those who were engaged in opposition to the market are unable to prosecute their arguments with any sense any longer because of the regulatory framework, the paradigm that has been established by this government for the tracking of cows and other product that is going to be exported. We have an industry worthwhile investing in. We have an industry that's Thank safe. you, Senator Thank Bishop. You. Your time has expired. Senator Heffernan. My God. Um, can I just correct the previous speaker? As Senator Back would know, the market has actually collapsed. Um, the price now, Senator Bishop, is about $1.40 or $1.50 when it was $2.15. I mean, don't try and come in here and say the market's recovered. It's collapsed. Can I just point out to the Senate with great uh, care? Uh, Mr uh, Deputy President, that the reason we're in this trouble is that mob over there don't get it. There isn't one not one single solitary soul in parliament in the government, with the exception of my good friend Ursula Stevens, who actually lives or makes a living in the bush. They have got no bloody idea. So can I just go to a few facts? I mean, sure, we, we've, had a, we've had a conflagration. Animals Australia their agenda is not to kill any stock. They, they don't actually think we should kill stock, and you certainly you shouldn't eat them. That's their final agenda. And when you ask them, all right, so we don't kill them, and I've done this, what do we do with them? Unless we castrate them all, and I have to declare an interest, this pocket knife is the pocket knife which I've castrated thousands of calves with a beautiful knife, and, and, and that's what you'd have to do to millions of cattle to stop them from breeding. Yeah, yeah, that's the knife. That's the one that you know is famous. Um, and so, like the utter contempt with, with, with this speech treats rural Australia is unforgivable. Can we say? Can I just say? Forget about what's happened. It's a complete mess, and it, it overlooks the fact because you're not allowed to talk and you're not allowed to speak about the fact that you can get a signature on any piece of paper in Asia if you pay them enough money. And we won't talk about the facilitation money that goes into all this trade and how, in, in the case of in, in the Middle East, where two lots of bribery money had a head-on collision and we ended up with a whole shipload of sheep having to be put down the chute. So we, we'll ignore all that. But can I just say that the North is a mess, as Senator Boswell pointed out. It's a conflagration of these decisions, the collapsing of the market. Now, bear in mind, if you think that the market at $2.15 was profitable and the market is now $1.40 that you can still do what you did, it doesn't even pay the freight. So we've got thousands of cattle up there, mature cattle that are overweight, which are unsuitable for the, for the local domestic market, that have got to go 3,000 kilometres to be, to be slaughtered. And when you do that, instead of getting a cheque in the mail, you get a bill. For the freight, the freight's worth more than the cattle because the market in, in Australia has collapsed for mature aged cattle and broken pistol bulls and uh, broken mouth cows. So we've got a serious problem. So as I've said earlier, in some places, we've got to solve this. It's not only putting a few cattle into the national parks, which would help. Uh, there's a lot of indigenous sit-down country you can put cattle into, which would help, and it would certainly help the indigenous as long as the water's there. And there are different management techniques. Some of these places up there are in more trouble than others because of the water management, where cattle have got more water points so they don't have to walk out as far to get a feed. And if they've got to walk out too far to get a feed, they can't walk back to the water. And there, as, as Senator Boswell said, there could be a million cattle going to die. 
If it comes worse to the worst, and, and the Barclay Tablelands and some of that country up there now looks now like it looks in September, which is just before the wet, why would we, together with no politics and all this, give consideration to what we did with the sheep years ago? And instead of saying to people, we'll send your cattle to slaughter, take up all the slots in the abattoirs, overdo the, the, uh, uh, the grinding market, why don't we say to them, well, we'll give you a certain amount of money, whether it's 50, 60, 80, or 100 dollars, to put them in a pit? Don't wear out the trucks. Don't use the fuel. This is a last resort thing. It's, it's, it's not there now, but we've got to plan ahead because if this dry continues and they miss the early wet, there's going to be a catastrophe. And the RSPCA and other people, Animals Australia, are probably all going bonkers because they'll be trying. These poor buggers will be trying to to truck poor cattle thousands of kilometres, which are not fit for trucking. It's time to consider, and I know the industry is a bit sensitive about this, but it's bloody well time someone talked about it. Why don't we give consideration to a slaughter levy to put them in a pit and, and, and at least they, they get paid to get rid of them rather than get a, get a bill in the mail for trucking them away? So, I mean, I have to say. Uh, the bush up there is in trouble. Some more trouble than others. Some are better managers than others. But we've got to have a plan Thank you, about the Senator future Heffernan. as much as worrying about the past. Your time has expired. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Again, we had this, dis this discussion, which impugns people on this side as though we have no knowledge of anything to do with rural Australia. Again, Mr. Deputy President, I point out that I come from a family with four generations of beef producers. I myself am not one, but if you go to any discussion in my family at any time in Queensland, you will find major discussions around what is good for this industry and what is not. And yes. Everyone knows that there are severe pressures and problems on the beef industry in Australia at the moment. But to say that all those problems can be attributed to the decision of this government to look at the issue of live cattle export is just not true. And the people over there know that, Mr Deputy President, because they know the producers better all as well as I do. And it is never a single issue. Already we've heard, both in Senator Boswell's questions and in Senator Heffernan's ex um, extensive taking note, a range of issues coming in about what the conditions are like in northern and western Queensland at the moment and, I believe, in other parts of Australia. There are serious problems in the market. But, Mr Deputy President, the decision that this government made to suspend the live cattle export several months ago was an exposure of a serious problem in the system. And I defy anyone to say that that's not true. What happened was an issue around the treatment of animals in some abattoirs in Indonesia, which should have been addressed earlier. And again, I say, who can say that's not true? The issues of poor treatment of animals in some of those um, areas has been identified. There have been statements made. We even have film. And I don't actually always trust everything that's on film, Mr Deputy President, but no one can deny that there needed to be some process put in place to ensure that those scenes that went across the world would not be able to be seen again. Because no one, the people who work in this industry, they value their stock. And when they produce them across the board in Northern Australia, they do not expect that the end result will be the treatment that we saw that some of that stock received. Now, the process that happened after that caused pain. There's no doubt about that. And I've spoken with many producers from the North and also from the Northern Territory who've come to this place to talk with us about how they feel about what's happened to their industry. One of the issues, Mr Deputy President, is that the industry has to look at future processes and the way they are marketing and the way they operate. Again, a point that Senator Heffernan made um, in his statement. There must be a way that we can effectively work with the department at the federal level, with the series of departments around the states, with the consumers and also the producers to ensure that we can have a safe, effective beef and other animals trade. But I do take the point that Senator um, Boswell's original question was about beef and not the other animals that came into the further discussions. Finally, and I believe it has taken too long, Mr Deputy President, but finally we have a process in place which actually can trace the, the stock from the, where they're produced 
all the way through the transit process, which has another series of issues about the most effective transit, transit processes, to where they end up and the way that they're slaughtered and brought into the market in other countries. We're focusing in this, in this discussion in Indonesia, and that's fair, but there are a range of other areas where this so, same process must work. Mr Deputy President, it is too easy to blame one issue for all the problems of the beef process. Beef prices are at a really bad level, believe me. Our um, family discussions talk about that at length. However, the prices cannot be attributed solely to the decision about the live cattle export. What we need to do is look at a range of things. And I actually take Senator Heffernan's point, though I don't take any discussion about that knife which, to which he was referring. I take his point that there needs to be a together process to look at what we do for people who rely on this industry. They are people who have served our country well. They produce fine stock. Australian beef is renowned. Across the, um, across the world for its quality. There have been real problems with how we actually look at beef that were destined for the export market but couldn't go there, and there were um, major issues, particularly in northern Australian ports around that time. That is a reality, and certainly the department has been taking up that point. There needs to be established this discussion, which continues to happen. We, as a nation, have determined that there will continue to be a live export trade. We need to make sure that works as well as possible. But, Mr Deputy President, we cannot have beef slaughtered the way it was in Indonesia. Thank you, Senator Moore. Senator Beck. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to reflect on the fact that we are in the midst now and will see develop even further the worst animal welfare disaster in Australia's history, and it can be put down to two causes, Mr Deputy President. One is the dishonest actions of animal activists, and the second has been the action of this Prime Minister, Prime Minister Gillard. Why do I speak of dishonesty on the part of the animal activists? I just ask one question, Deputy President. How was it if footage was found in January or February? of 2011, it took until the end of May or early June of that year before we saw that footage on public television. Answer that question and I will be satisfied. Deputy President, I have demonstrated and shown that that footage was dishonest and I will continue to say so. And I now turn to the actions of the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister took this action because she wanted to get carbon tax, a matter over which she said would never happen. Under a government she led, she wanted to get it off the front page of the newspaper. At the time this happened, I begged the Minister for Agriculture that he did not, did not ban the trade to abattoirs in Indonesia that were compliant with international standards for slaughtering of cattle. And yet he went ahead and did so. I had no difficulty, no difficulty as the only veterinarian in this parliament for him banning the trade to abattoirs that did not comply. And if there was any truth at all in the footage that we saw, then those abattoirs should have been banned. But on what basis? On what basis would we ban the trade to abattoirs that are internationally acceptable? On what basis would we turn around and remove the protein for 69 million Indonesian people of low socioeconomic background who were relying on this country, once a proud country, once a pr country that would never have ever been the subject of a discussion about sovereign risk. Why and how? Imagine another country did that to our country of Australia without consultation, without negotiation, without even informing them that we would turn around and we would ban that trade. And I regret to have Senator Bishop come in here now and say that the trade has increased, that prices have increased. Well, I can assure Senator Bishop and anyone else listening today that is false. We have got cattle dying. I indicated after 2011 that if we had a poor season, if we had an ongoing drought and if we had poor conditions, we would see an animal welfare disaster of a type we've never seen before. And you are right, through the chair, Senator Boswell, we will see up to the death of a million cattle. Recently, the cattlemen went through Ag Force to the Queensland government and said, can we reopen some national parks and state parks that were themselves? that were themselves cattle stations. We're not talking about the Daintree rainforest. We're talking about areas that were themselves cattle stations. The Queensland government acting responsibly. No, Senator Conroy, not acting irresponsibly, acting responsibly. 
have allowed graziers to turn their cattle in there. And we now have Environmental Minister Burke threatening to use the legislation to not only demand those cattle are removed, but actually to fine those graziers. Be clear on this, Mr Deputy President. Why have we got that disaster? The cows are about to calve in North Queensland and across the north. The calves from last year should be being prepared to be shipped overseas. They are still there. And the calves from two seasons ago should long have been in our export markets. And I have to stand there now talking to colleagues from Indonesia, to those from the Middle East with whom I was associated when I was a veterinarian in the live animal trade, and explain to them why it is that Australia's reputation has been trashed. And if I can finish on the point of animal welfare where I commenced, Deputy President, and it is this. Of all of the 109 countries in the world that export live animals, only one, and that is Australia, only one attends to animal welfare and management and husbandry and transport in its target markets, and we have done so for years. It is Australia that has elevated the standards of animal welfare in our target markets, and if we are caused, if we are caused to exit those markets, I will tell you what will happen to animal welfare standards in those countries. Rest assured, they are still importing. The Saudis, who used to import three million sheep a year from us, are still importing nine million sheep a year. And I've got to stand there and I've got to face the pastoralists and the farmers who are shooting stock and who themselves are facing suicide as a result of the decisions of this government. Thank you, Senator Back. I'll put the question that the motion moved by Senator Boz will be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale, on a separate matter? Yes, on a separate matter. If you wish to move a motion to take note of the answers you wish to take note of? Yes, I'd, I wish to move a motion to take note of uh, an answer given uh, in question time today. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy or Mr Deputy President. I was very happy, in fact, today to ask a question on behalf of our say. Our say was launched during the 2010 election campaign with the goal of using new technologies to connect the public with decision makers, with lawmakers. It was founded by a team of young Australians from across the political spectrum uh, and doing more and more work abroad, including in India, the world's largest democracy. In fact, the Prime Minister herself took part in an Our Say event last year when she answered questions during a Google Hangout. The People's Question Project aims to close the distance between citizens and the halls of power by inviting elected reps to speak directly to the issues raised by the community. And I was happy to ask the question, uh, Mr Deputy President, because, uh, in my view, a question time is broken. Uh, what we get is the usual parade of predictable questions from the opposition, questions that are aimed more at trying to get a grab in the six o'clock news bulletin, more aimed at spinning a line than, in fact, aimed at approving the government on issues of public policies. What we get from the government are non-answers, obfuscation, and we rarely get the questions being addressed. We get Dorothy Dixes, we get insults, we get bickering. Uh, question time in this place is broken, and it is uh, with great pleasure that I was able to bring in the voice of the community into this chamber. Uh, now I know that members of the community who did ask and vote for this question would not have been ha happy with the, ministers, uh, the answers given by the minister today. Uh, what they want to hear is a respectful, honest debate, and they want to get some sense that the government is taking these issues seriously. Um, it's no surprise that the public do want to see a change in approach to the issue of drug law reform in uh, this chamber. Uh, and it's an area where public common sense and the conventional wisdom of the parliament are at odds. Uh, that's not true of all politicians in this place. In fact, I had uh, the pleasure of standing next to uh, uh, Mel Washer, uh, the uh, con conservative member of parliament, and with Rob Ikeshot, an independent, to discuss this issue and to call for a dispassionate look um, from the Productivity Commission. And in fact, uh, we'd like to see the issue referred to the Productivity 
a commission. Usually this is the domain of retired politicians. It's amazing how, how much braver, how much more courageous politicians become on the issue of illicit drugs when they leave the chamber. And uh, unfortunately, what we get from our sitting MPs is usually deathly silence, or worse still, uh, cheap populism. Now, I'm very happy to stand here and say that we do need to uh, tackle this issue. Uh, we are currently paying an enormous price for our current uh, approach. Uh, we're getting uh, people from the former UN Secretary General, for example, Kofi Annan, and Alan Jones, now both together saying that we need to take this on and we need to reform what we're currently doing. Unfortunately, there's no sign of a change in approach. We've seen the response to the issue of emerging synthetic drugs in the news recently, and of course it's business as usual. Let's blunder ahead with the same failed policies and let's, in the end, expose people to more harms, to more harmful, dangerous substances. The threshold decision here is, are we prepared to take this issue on as an issue of public health? Are we prepared to say that this issue needs to be dealt with through the health framework rather than simply rattling the law and order chain? That's what the threshold decision needs to, that needs to be made in this chamber. In fact, in New Zealand we saw a very different change in approach to the issue of emerging synthetic drugs. Uh, where we're going to see the impetus on uh, the industry to actually prove a safety. Uh, and that, I think, is an important step forward. Uh, we have an opportunity to do that here in Australia rather than going down the same failed road. And yet, at this stage, it looks like politicians are all, on all sides are not prepared to do what the public health community, what the drug and alcohol sector say, which is let's invest more in treatment, let's invest more in harm reduction, and let's start treating this issue as it must be treated, as a public health issue rather than as a law and order issue. The question is the motion moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think the ayes have it.